Business combinations. Topic three, consolidated financial statements. When one company obtains control over another through the purchase of its shares, the investor is known as the parent and the investee is known as the subsidiary. These are and still remain as separate legal entities, but can also be seen as one economic entity. So each parent and sub maintains separate accounting records. Each remains separate legal entities, but together they are also a combined consolidated entity in which IFRS requires the preparation of consolidated financial statements. This preparation of consolidated financial statements shows the performance of the entire family or group of companies. Consolidated financial statements are often prepared using worksheets, which start off separating both the parents and the subsidiaries' books. Then there are journal entries made during consolidation. Uh, these journal entries are booked on the worksheet. They are not booked on the standalone financial statements of either entity. These are prepared so that the users of the parents' financial statements can understand the full economic picture of what the parent owns. Uh, this shows the group's transactions with outside entities only. And as such, all intercompany transactions would be eliminated. We calculate goodwill the same way that we do when purchasing the net assets of a company, except here, there are two steps. So to calculate goodwill when purchasing the shares of a company, we start with the total consideration given. We then first deduct the carrying value of the acquiree's net assets, after which that's referred to the acquisition differential. Then we allocate that acquisition differential to any fair value differentials. That is the difference between the acquiree's net um, assets book value and their fair value. Then what's left is goodwill. So again, this is really the same step we did in the previous video where we took acquisition costs less fair value of the net assets, but here we broke it into two parts, the book value of the net assets, then the difference between the fair value and the book value, which we have now called fair value differentials. We do this here because unlike in the previous example where we took net assets and completely put them on the purchaser's financial statements under the purchase of net assets method um, and effectively leaving behind a shell of a company, here when we purchase the shares of the company, that company continues to operate. The people working there may not even realize there was a change of control. As such, each entity, the purchaser and the company purchased, continue to create separate entity financial statements. However, the purchaser has since gained control and must provide consolidated set of financial statements to reflect the economic reality that they have control of the, over the other entity and are subject to the risks and reward of that business. As such, the book value for both companies are the starting points of the consolidated financial statements. We then bump up the book value to fair value of the subsidiary using these incremental fair value differentials. You'll see this as we continue going throughout using the worksheet method of acquisition, which will show the flow of transactions at acquisition. Uh, my friend who continues to work in industry as a consultant, financial reporting consultant, refers to these fair value differentials as FV bumps. So she'll do so I'll just refer to them as bumps. Oh yeah, the FE bumps, 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 bumps. Um, the key here to keep in mind is that both entities continue to operate separately at and after acquisition, but the company in power must also provide a separate set of consolidated financial statements, which would be the book value of the parent and the fair value of the sub at acquisition and subsequent to that. So let's look at an example and make this a bit more concrete. We have the purchase of shares where company P buys 100% of the shares of company S for $400,000 on December 31st, 2019. Information on the companies are below. And right now we're looking at what do the consolidated financial statements look like at acquisition. 
I'm going to transfer this to a spreadsheet and look at it in more depth there. All right, so here we are. Since the question didn't specify how they paid for it, we're going to assume that company P bought 100% of the shares of company S for $400,000 in cash. First steps first, let's go through and figure out what the acquisition differential is. So we have our total consideration, which was our $400,000, which we just assumed would be cash. We then have to look at less the carrying value of the subs net assets. So less carrying value of subs um, net assets. So carrying value is just another way of saying book value. So we're looking at less the, um, the assets and the liabilities, the book values that so come up here, book value of company S, liabilities of company S, And we have the net assets, company S. So now we have our acquisition differential of 400,000 less the book value of the net assets, the carrying value. So we have an acquisition differential of $130,000. All right, so now let's figure out how much of that acquisition is related to those fair value differentials, those FV bumps, and how much is remaining for goodwill? And is that goodwill positive, meaning they paid in excess of the, um, in excess of the net identifiable uh, fair value of assets, or did they get a quote unquote good deal and have to recognize negative goodwill on their financial statements as a gain on the sale? So let us see what we have. Okay. Let us write down our fair FVDs, where we have our fair value less our, oops, we have our FV minus our BVs here. So first we want to look at our assets. So our assets, um, fair value of our assets equals our 580 minus the book value. So we have, um, difference of fair value and book value of 20,000. And then we look at our liabilities. And here's some things, so you don't have to get too mixed around with if it's FV or BV. So liabilities are otherwise known as negative assets. So if it's FV minus BV for assets, then we can leave it as FV minus BV for liabilities, keeping in mind that liabilities are negative assets. So equals negative FV of our liabilities, which is 280 minus negative 330, so when you minus a negative, we add it. So here we receive a fair value differential of 50,000. So what these two numbers here represent is this acquisition differential, this amount that was paid in excess of the book value, 20,000 is gonna go to the fat pact, pardon me, $20,000 is going to go to the fact that we are acquiring uh, assets that are worth $20,000 under their um, under their book value, so we'll have to decrease assets. And then 50,000 represents the fact that we actually got a good deal on the fair value. So we get to allocate the fact that the book value is 330, but they're in fact worth $50,000 less. So we get to um, recognize the fact that part of that differential is allocated to the $50,000. So we add these two together and we get our total fair value uh, differential of $30,000. We take our, in order to find goodwill, we take our acquisition differential and we minus the net of those FV minus book value and we're left with goodwill of 100,000. So again, here, what does this mean? It means that we paid, the parent paid $400,000 for a company whose book value was worth 270,000. So there was an acquisition differential of 130. That acquisition differential got allocated 20, it actually increased, if you look at this, by the fact that they got um, $20,000 less of fair value of, book, of the um, net assets, of the assets. 
Um, but then they got a good deal on $50,000 here. So that is a fair value uh, differential of net fair value differential of 30,000, which means that of this $130,000 acquisition differential, $100,000 is then what was paid above and beyond the net assets, the difference between their book value and their fair value. So how does this translate uh, quite literally to the financial statements, to what the combined economic entity will look like? Let's take a look. So first, when company P buys company S, they record it in their standalone financial statements. So they would debit their investment in company S and credit cash. We then follow the following steps in order to combine the financial statements of both company P and company S, as well as book those fair value differentials and remove the investment. So we're actually gonna remove this company S and replace it with company S itself at fair value. All right, how are we gonna do it? First, remove that investment. Because we're removing that investment and putting on the net assets, we also need to remove company S's equity, otherwise we'd be double counting it. Uh, we would, in doing so, record the acquisition differential, but then allocate it. So at the end of the day, there really, there absolutely shouldn't be any account that says acquisition differential. It's just a kind of a placeholder for us to kind of work through all of these steps using the worksheet method. Okay, let's take a look at what that looks like in Excel. All right, so in our worksheet, we're gonna go from our book value of our parent and our book value of our sub, and then we are going to look at this acquisition calculation, translate those into journal entries. And so we can get to a point where our consolidated financial statements has the reflection of the book value of company P, the fair value of company S, as well as any goodwill generated from the transaction. Okay, so let's take a look at all this work that we did here to calculate goodwill, because that was step one. So now let's turn this into journal entries. Our first journal entry is going to be to completely remove company S's equity. So we're going to debit common shares and we are going to debit retained earnings. And this is going to be again to remove company S's book value of their common shares and retained earnings. Uh, because these are both equity accounts, I may have just had one account that says uh, that said equity. Um, here I had it separated into two. Either are acceptable. Okay. And now I want to remove uh, the investment in S from company P's consolidated financial statements. So how do I know what this is going to be? Well, that's what they recorded it at. That's what they paid for company S. They paid 400000 So that's what I'm going to remove. Okay. So what is the difference between this equity and the 400,000. Well, equity is another way of saying net assets. And net assets is what we removed here, the carrying value of subs net assets. So you will see that the difference between what was recorded for company S and P's books and the equity equals our fair value, pardon me, equals our acquisition differential here. So I'm just gonna do a debit to a fake account called Acquisition Differential. As I said before, uh, there will be no account named Acquisition Differential on our consolidated financial statements, but this is like a, it's a halfway step. It's a nice breather to kind of get the first chunk of our journal entries done. And this is to, to remove investment in S from books. So it removes both their uh, but, uh, their equity accounts as well as the investment accounts from company S and from company P. So again, friendly reminder that these journal entries do not live on company P's books. They do not live on company S's books. Where, where do they live? They live on the worksheet that's going to bring us from the separate entity books to the combined consolidated financial statements that reflect the power that company P has over company S. Okay. So now I have this acquisition differential, which I told you was a fake account. So let us just go get rid of that now before I forget to do so. So I'm gonna credit my acquisition differential of 130,000. Okay, Whew, it's gone. 
Now what do I do? Well, I need to go from my acquisition differential all the way down to my goodwill, and I know that I have a difference between the fair value, 580, what I need to reflect for company S's assets, um, but right now I have it recorded at 600,000. So how do I go from 600 to 580? Well, that would be a credit of 20,000. So I'm going to lower uh, the assets for the, and this is, I'm not going to, I'm just going to write credit to assets, but you know that it's for the fair value bump. And that's a credit for that $20,000 that we have right here. Similarly, I have combined, when I add up the book values of both, I'll have 330,000 reflecting company S's liabilities, but I want it to be at 280 because I have to reflect the fair value of company S. So how do I go from a 330 liability to a 280 liability? Well, I get to debit the liability to go from 330 to 280. So I'm going to debit the liability by $50,000 for that fair value differential. Okay, and now what do I have left? I have goodwill. This is positive goodwill. So positive goodwill is an asset. And I am going to debit that by 100000 do a quick double check. 150, 150, fantastic. And this is to allocate my fair value differentials and determine goodwill at acquisition. Okay, again, three parts to a journal entry account, number, description. Account, number, description. And bonus when it balances because we are accountants and things must balance. Okay. So now I need to go from, I've done my calculations, I've done my journal entries, it is time to make some financial statements. So let us go and do that. I am just going to scroll here to where I have the starting figures for our items here. And I'm just going to make this a touch bit smaller to make sure I can include everything here. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my journal entries here. I have my starting accounts. You can check out this lecture example. This will be in your Brightspace and it'll be available before the deadline. So you can take a look. I've simply taken the book value for each one of these here and that'll be our starting financial statements. And you can just kind of check on me, uh, make sure our math is all good. But our financial statements, one of the reasons why I love to have the worksheet method is our checks. And our checks always tell us that our assets have to equal our liabilities plus our equity. So I like to have little checks along the bottom just to make sure that my math is going okay. And I get really happy when my checks are zero. I like to highlight them just to draw attention. If there's anything other than a zero, I'm going to be upset. Okay, so now let's take our adjustments, uh, aka our elimination entries. So we go from the book value of the parent the book value of the sub, and what do we want to get over here? Our consolidated financial statements, which are the parent's book value, plus the sub's fair value, uh, and eliminating any intercompany transactions, such as double counting equity or double counting any investments. So that's our goal over here. So to get there, we use the journal entries that we just walked through. And what we're going to do is I'm going to walk through and just systematically post each one of these journal entries to my worksheet account here. So I have debit of common shares to remove the subs, common shares, and retain earnings. So I'm simply going to debit common shares, and I'm going to debit retain earnings. And then similarly, I need to remove the investment in sub, so I'm going to credit the uh, investment in sub here. And then I am going to have my fake account, which better be zero by the end. I'll put another highlight there just in case. And I am going to have a debit to my acquisition differential account here. Okay, so I've just posted one journal entry. I'm gonna have a separate check for this. And what my check here is going to be is I need all my debits to equal all of my credits. So just visually, I'll make sure that those are equal. Maybe I'll also set up a secondary thing right here. Okay, and do I want to format it all pretty? Sure, why the heck not? Let's waste five seconds. 
Okay, guys, uh, I'm gonna post on to my second one. So let's allocate that acquisition differential. Let's get it out of there. That's a credit. I got my assets, which I discussed above. That's gonna be a credit of 20,000. And then I have a debit to my liabilities for 50,000. And I have my Goodwill. My Goodwill asset is a debit of 100,000. I have my debits equal my credits. And now it's time to pull these across. So an asset plus an asset minus a credit gets me to my consolidated assets of 1.68 million. My investments in S are a debit and then minus a credit, which makes sense because that's what I was trying to do from here. Remove investment in S from books on both sides. My acquisition differential is a debit minus a credit equals zero. That makes me happy. We put a little happy face for things that make us happy. And we have goodwill. Uh, so we have nothing in our starting. We have a debit. We have ending goodwill of 100,000. I'm going to add up all of my net assets here. Pardon me, all of my assets here for 1.78 million. Coming down here, I have my liabilities, book value of parents plus book value of subs, and then I have a debit. So because liabilities are in a credit position, I'm gonna minus my debit here, which gets me an ending balance of our liabilities of 880,000. Then I have my common shares, parents plus subs, minus the debit. And here, what makes us happy is we've completely eliminated the subsidiary's book value of their common shares, which makes sense because we smushed on um, their total assets above here. Similarly, we have our book value of retained earnings plus book value of retained earnings minus the debit. So here we're left with just the book value of the, of, um, the parents' retained earnings, which is fabulous. We successfully eliminated the subsidiary because we included it when we smushed together the two companies here. Okay, so let's add up our total uh, liabilities and equity here. And then we can do our check. We have assets minus liabilities plus equity equals zero. We have two happy faces. People, we are happy. Good job. Um, I want you to pause the video right now and pat yourself on the back for making it this far. I then want you to go back and rewatch this and try this on your own. Stumble through, make some notes. And I say stumble with love. I stumbled several, several times through um, my first and second and third and fourth and fifth times. This is something um, that really uh, emphasizes when I say learning is repeated exposure to same or similar topics. Write yourself some notes. Um, this is... This is the last part of the building blocks of this um, of this course. And now we're gonna continue to go down what different acquisition of shares look like and more eliminations and more eliminations. Uh, I really want you to get comfy and cozy and ask lots of questions, email me, um, just, just try this um, because from here, we continue to build down this silo. Okay, a few more slides and then we are done. So the... Spreadsheet I just walked you through and created with you, that's referred to as the worksheet approach. You also have the direct approach. The direct approach is, as the name implies, direct. It gets you from point A to point Z. Uh, it's harder to organize, harder to follow, possible for more errors. It essentially smushes both companies together and um, manually adds and pluses those fair value differentials. There is many fewer checks along the way, um, and it really just a possibility for more errors. So while I want you to know the direct approach is there, know that that's what operates behind most consolidation softwares. As we're learning this, let's go through and use the worksheet approach. And let me tell you uh, that many small and medium-sized entities uh, that do have, even public entities, like um, my one friend that I mentioned before, one of the companies that she worked for was VP Finance for. Uh, they used a spreadsheet approach, the worksheet approach, um, to consolidate at least uh, seven different entities because for them, uh, the way that their entities were structured, it was important to show various stakeholders uh, the work in which those entities rolled up. A brief note on depreciable assets. You may see depreciable assets shown as one number 
Or you may see depreciable assets as being shown as two numbers, both a cost and accumulated depreciation number. To simplify, because it isn't a material aspect in our course and our understanding, we're going to simplify and always refer to depreciable assets as their starting net book value. So their cost less any accumulated depreciation. So even if it's a depreciable asset, we'll just call it like tractor asset, for example. Okay, push down accounting. This is something for ASPE only. And this is only permitted when a parent purchases 90% of the subsidiary. Push down accounting means that on the acquisition date under this method, the subsidiary revalues all their assets and liabilities to fair value on their financial statements. In effect, we push down the acquisition differential to the subsidiary. This means the subsidiary standalone balance sheet would then have the same amounts as included in the consolidated balance sheet. Please, I stress, this is only permitted under certain circumstances under ASPE when a parent purchases greater than 90% of the subsidiary. Um, it is not mandatory, it is optional, um, but what you will see in essentially the next, right up until the end of term test number two, um, if you had pushed down accounting uh, permitted in IFRS, which, you know, for so many reasons we just couldn't do, um, this would eliminate essentially all the work that we do uh, after acquisition. So again, this is not allowed under IFRS and only limited under these certain circumstances under ASPE. Uh, for exam purposes, you need to understand this at relatively, basically about an awareness level, uh, as well as application in very limited, um, uh, like theoretical approaches. Reverse takeover. So when shares of the acquirer are issued as consideration for an acquisition, this transfers some ownership of the parent to the subsidiary. A reverse takeover occurs when so many shares are issued as consideration that the legal acquiree gains voting control over the legal acquirer. The acquirer becomes a subsidiary for consolidation purposes and the acquiree becomes the parent, hence the term reverse takeover. When would this happen? Well, for example, if there's a listed entity who is just a shell, so perhaps they were the company from a previous example who sold all their net assets and were left with just cash and equity, perhaps that shell of a company issues shares to, quote, purchase another company, yet those shares are equal to 100% of their outstanding shares which in fact means that they, substance over form, sold their company to the company they acquired and were then reverse takeovered. The legal parent, legal parent is the listed entity, would then be consolidated by the subsidiary. The subsidiary then has control over this legal entity. And if they were a legal listed entity, it means that they are now a listed uh, entity. So why would they do this? Well, what I just walked you through was a reverse takeover. So a private company could become a public company because that private company, which was quote, acquired, now has control over the listed entity and are now in fact listed themselves. Uh, typically what you would do is the next day you would have an amalgamation. So the, um, the, Company in control would then um, would then amalgamate um, the private company and the listed company would amalgamate, become one legal entity, um, and thus that's how a reverse takeover helps a private company become public. Um, as you know from other courses, and as we mentioned briefly in IFA two, uh, a lot of reporting has to happen in order to go. For me, a lot of reporting and a lot of um, Oh, gosh, like auditing compliance requires a company to go from being private to going public. So a reverse takeover is a way in which they can expedite this. Um, they would typically pay a decent premium in order to receive um, this shell of a company in order to uh, in order to execute this reverse takeover. So what do we need to know and what do we need to watch out for? Well, for our purposes, we need to remember to always look at the substance 
over the form of who an acquirer is, with the red flag being if a company uses share consideration as a part of or all of their purchase of another company's shares, they put themselves at risk for being reverse takeovered, either accidentally or on purpose. Let's look at an example of this. Possibly. You be the judge. Wasp Inc. purchased 100% of Bees Inc.'s shares by issuing $100,000 worth of Wasp Inc. shares as consideration on the acquisition date when the shares were trading at $50. Previously, Wasp Inc. had 10,000 shares outstanding. After the purchase, what percent of Wasp is owned by B? Is it A, 67%, B, 20%, C, 15%, or D, 17%? If you answer D, you'd be correct. Since there was 100,000 shares issued, we take 100,000 and divide it by the worth, which was $50 per share. So 20,000 shares were issued, 2,000 shares were issued. Previous to those shares being issued, there was 10,000 shares. So there's 10,000 shares previous, plus the 2,000 shares that were issued, meaning there are 12,000 total shares outstanding. 2,000 shares issued to, um, to Wasp and divided by the 12,000 available. And we have 16.667, so 17% of Wasp is now owned by B. So the correct answer is D. And also, this would not be an example of reverse takeover. Had the correct answer been a, 67%, that's more than 50%, that in fact would be a reverse takeover. All right, great, great work. I appreciate you so much. Congratulations on completing this week, and I look forward to seeing you in the next set of videos. Thanks.